Good morning, good afternoon, and uh, good evening, wherever you're listening. Thank you so much for uh, coming back and tuning in. Today, I have a returning guest. I have uh, Richard Fairgrave today. Um, last time we spoke was when you were doing your uh, Kickstarter for Octopus. Yeah, yeah. That that one went um, shockingly well. Turns out people want to know about my filthy life. Hey, it was a great story, man. <laughs> and um, yeah, so... Uh, how are you doing? I mean, uh, we that was back probably like uh, right around the holidays when we spoke about Octopus. How have you been? I've been good. Um, I I really wanted to kind of like jump on this one right away and and kind of just keep moving with it. I I I think everyone who does Kickstarter develops like a little bit of an addiction to it because <laughs> you know it's it's like a video game that you don't really have to have any uh, skill once you start playing it. And I think that's like that's like the ideal for me. Like I love the idea of video games where I would line up, get there before everyone else, buy the best possible copy, and then it would play itself. I guess really what I want is a DVD, not a video game. Now that I describe that out loud, but <laughs> you know, like obviously you have to make a really good book to do well on Kickstarter. But once the Kickstarter kicks off, you aside from like doing interviews and doing social media and what have you, you you don't really have any control of how it's going to go. People are either going to like it or not. And that becomes the challenge. It's like you're you're pulling the arm on a one arm bandit, and then it just keeps spinning for a month. <laughs> and uh, also, um, you know, with uh, having a uh, haunted hill coming out, um, and then you know, for the complete first volume, um, and having a Kickstarter for uh, for both books. Besides, uh, you know, what you just described, what would you say are some of the biggest um, challenges uh, you uh, kind of figure out when you're doing a Kickstarter? Um, you know, I think it's it's sort of strange that the first Kickstarter, the one for Octopus, because it was a memoir, um, I spent like six to eight hours a day every day for the first week of the campaign doing interviews where I had to be like upbeat and pretty happy about <laughs> like the worst possible thing to talk about. You know, like here's the worst 18 months of my life, or at least the most tumultuous. There's some fun in there. But I I, I came away from it being like, I am so drained. And I just want to do it again, but I'm so drained. And I was like, Haunted Hill is going to be really easy because, of course, Haunted Hill isn't about me. It's about someone who's just a lot like me. <laughs> and it's about, like, it's it's a book that I made right at the beginning of, of uh, not at the beginning of COVID, but like six months in, um, I was, uh, I got stuck in Canada, essentially. And I was missing Hollywood desperately. And one day I was, um, not to overshare, but I was like on Yelp reading reviews of um, of my favorite sex club because I mm -hmm. thought it was really funny that people would like review a sex club with their real name on Yelp. And <laughs> it broke my heart because all of these people were like, oh, this place was really important to me and I can't go there anymore. It's the only way that I could feel connected to the world. And it's it's a place, you know, the, one of the few places in L.A. that's really welcoming of different body types and different ages. And I was like, oh, shit, this place like I was I was like, I'm just there for the sex. But I guess for a lot of people that really it, it meant a lot to them. And it's that thing of like. You know, when you notice that you really like the smell of dry cleaning and then you realize that that means everything matters because if something that small can bring you happiness, then like something that small could also destroy you. And I was like, I have to tell a story. I have to, I have to be back in Hollywood somehow because my favorite place on earth. It's, you know, it's a disgusting, awful place, but like, that's exactly <laughs> what I love. And so I started making this book and I had two days off in between two other things. Um, and I thought, well, I'll just do like a little short story. And it's just about a woman who's just uh, interviewed for a job as the daytime janitor at Slamtown, which is a fictionalized version of, of the sex club. And it's just it's just about her. Like she she shares a cigarette with a young woman she meets on the street and then her Uber cancels on her and she gets a ride home. And she says when they say, where do you live? She says, oh, I live in Haunted Hill. And I had had this idea that Haunted Hill was a great name for a place for a really long time because when I first saw the movie House on Haunted Hill, I was very annoyed because that film should actually be called Haunted House on Completely Regular Hill. There is nothing <laughs> haunted about the hill in that film. And I've been like trying to toy with the idea for years of like, well, how would I haunt a hill? Obviously, you'd have to bury a bunch of ghosts there, right? Mm -hmm. So I've also had this ongoing thing of like, why is Hollywood so weird? What's the energy that makes everyone like everyone who goes there feels like everything is possible. And part of it is that like, 
if you want to work in entertainment, you probably have the, I don't want to say the mind of a child, but like the wide-eyed uh, optimism of a child, I guess. And Hollywood is the place where dreams go to die because that wide-eyed optimism and kid logic is confronted by real human emotion and finances. And so there's this constant like friction and energy in the air of people who believe anything is possible, despite the fact that they're constantly being told it isn't. And I was like, okay, but that that only explains like half of it. Why then is there also a guy outside of my office who yells at me about volcanoes and how the government controls them? Why is there the dude who <laughs> just like Willie Nelson, who sometimes is covered in gold? Like, why, why is there so much going on in this place? And I was like, oh, because it's a haunted hill, obviously. Um, and so I thought, well, now it's all like all, all just sort of fitting together. I was like, I'm missing Hollywood. I miss I miss Slammer. I miss the weirdness i missed the energy and it was covid so i was like missing people this is pre-vaccine like i hadn't seen anyone except my husband for about six months at this point and this little six-page story then uh which i drew in the two days then i didn't get the notes on the other book that i was waiting for so i did it another six pages and then another and then another and then suddenly i was like oh i'm like six issues deep on this fucker and I don't really know what to do with it. Like I'm making this weird ass book that's entirely for me. And meanwhile, I'm like releasing all of these children's books and all this family friendly content and all of this. And I'm looking at this thing of like woman who works as daytime janitor at sex club who says that cleaning up gay men's jizz is a feminist action because it was never going to be weaponized against women. And like getting in a car with some people in their twenties because like her Uber cancels on her because she's very difficult to be around and has a very low star rating. And then obviously when you get in a car with people in their twenties, a 10 minute ride home turns into like this all night adventure because like you have to stop for donuts and a couple breaks up and you pick up a homeless guy and someone takes a shit in the car and you have to go to an abandoned trampoline park and see your friend perform comedy at a grocery store. And then you have to break into someone's house to steal back a sex tape that they made of a member of the group. And it's like, like largely based on a true story. Um, mm -hmm. That happened right before the first lockdown but like it's i don't know there's just this like liveliness to it and it, it's become the thing that i'm obsessed with my goal now is to do um a 312 issue run on this book wow. but I, I i think i'm going to release it in six issue arcs <laughs> to start with and see how it goes that's uh that's one hell of a goal that's uh that's i definitely awesome, didn't though. answer your question even a little bit the biggest challenge i think was deciding on on what what stickers to make. Gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> and so um, I'm guessing uh, the backers uh, for uh, for volume one can expect some uh, some goodies. So stickers being one of them. Yeah. Um. I like we've got, you know got obviously the regular print edition, and I like books to be cheap. So it's I think twenty five US uh, for or about that. It's I'm, I'm doing it in Canadian dollars because I'm still stuck here, but um. 25 us for the 128 page book and then there is a sexy cover everyone kept pressuring me to do sexy covers and with the memoir they're like you got to put some tits on the cover i'm like it's a comic about me being very gay for 18 months i'm not sure how many tits were involved but sure i guess i'll draw <laughs> myself like sitting drawing in a sitting at a drawing desk in the back corner of a strip club or something like fuck off so <laughs> then with this one they're like do a sexy cover richard it'll make you've got all these like you got all these women as your main characters in this one. Do a sexy cover. I'm like, I don't want to, I don't want to objectify my, my main characters. Like, this is not the kind of book for that. But what if I did the gayest sexy cover of all time? So it's Eva cleaning up at the sex club while a massive gay orgy goes on around her. And no one's bothering her. They're just having a nice time. She's got her earbuds in. She's cleaning the floor. And meanwhile, there's like 18 dicks just coming all over the place. <laughs> all with UV spot treatment, by the way. Wow. <laughs> Looking forward to so that cover. If, if you like those like upgrades, like shiny jizz on the covers, is is, is I tried to get glow in the dark, um, mm -hmm. but it's just the technology isn't there yet. Ah, uh, gotcha. And uh, I would assume it would be pretty pricey too for glow yeah. in the dark. <laughs> well, we're doing. We're also. I say we. It's me. This is like. There's no other person involved in this insane approach. Um, I've got uh stickers. As I said, uh, Eva has a shirt that just says "spit" across it, so I have a spit sticker which I think is like just a good message. And I'm, I'm going big with these fuckers. Like I'm not doing these little two and a half by two and a half circles. I'm doing like a five inch wide. Like this is the bumper sticker that you've wanted for your grandma's coffin. Um, so <laughs> I've got the spit one. I've got a really, because the cover is a, um, if anyone, if you haven't seen the cover, it's, it's a, someone sticking three fingers up through a donut. Donut, yeah. Um, <laughs> so I'm doing a sticker, which is just a nice aerial shot of a cartoony pink donut that just says, put your fingers in my hole. 
Uh, <laughs> and so I think that one will be a, a big seller as well. Or, or not, who knows? Uh, and then I'm doing sketch covers. I'm doing like the, all of the usual stuff. Mm-hmm. The the thing that's like um, the the fun one, I guess, or the, I don't know, the hook, uh, who knows? Um, all of the art on this is, it's all all hand-drawn, hand-colored, hand-lettered. It's it's photographs instead of uh, scans. So it's like unedited, uneditable. And I'm doing the pencils on separate pages and using a light box to do the inks. Um, and so I have 100 pages of, or 108 pages of pencils sitting around. Uh, so for 50 bucks, you get a copy of the book. And then inside it is, and 50 Canadian, so like 37 real dollars. Um, so you get a copy of the book and then uh, fold it up inside it is a page of the original pencils because like one, that doesn't increase the shipping price. And two, I think it's really funny to fold up original art. (laughs) (laughs) Makes sense. Uh, Also one big uh, burning question that I have for you, um, especially in Haunted Hill, um, you know, so it's kind of based on a true story. However, uh, how do you come up with uh, original uh, character designs such as um because and the reason i bring that up is because the you know, octopus was your memoir so you know you can easily mm-hmm. recreate stuff um and with with haunted hill it's uh you know completely new characters honestly it's about just like finding fun shapes to draw um i don't really do character designs you know i, I see all these people who are like in the back of this trade paperback we're gonna have pages and pages of fun character designs and other behind the scenes things i'm like oh i never do that i should i really should but instead what i do is i have an idea for a comic and on panel one i think i wonder what the person saying this line would look like and i draw that um so the pencils on page one there's a lot of a lot of uh <laughs> erasing and redrawing and <laughs> mess on there but and then that's kind of true for like every single comic I do. So Eva was designed on the page. Um, I had a vague idea for uh, for Sasha, the other, this kind of second lead in the story, or at least in the story, um, because I really wanted to have someone with like impossible hair uh, that just stuck straight up. And so I, I had like a little bit of a, a time with that. Um, after I've done the first page, sometimes I'll like sit and just doodle different expressions for the character and kind of like make sure that I'm not going to get stuck later on. Like, you know, we, we all know when we watch, there are certain TV shows we watch where like, hey, Arnold, great looking show, terrible character design on that that guy. <laughs> because like in profile, he looks ridiculous. Helga, spherical head with a big black line running through it. Great. she's She looks good from every angle. Arnold looks terrible. So I'll, I'll do like some like rough stuff on that, but it really... I'm working in a very cartoony way. So there's a lot of ability to like stretch out expressions and I'm obsessed with micro expressions in comics and controlling time with, um, with, with tiny panels and things to show someone, you know, like if someone's going to say one line of dialogue, I'm doing the lettering on the page. I have full control of like how and when those words are said. And I don't need to show you saying one sentence with one expression. I can show you doing four expressions as you get through that sentence. If like, if it's a difficult sentence to get through and if you need to like move your way through some some complicated words and so like i, I learn a lot about the characters through that um then there are characters who i want to remain very still and boring there's a guy named keith who's just kind of a dick he's 25 he won a screenwriting competition one time and now he thinks he's like god's gifted narrative um so he's in there <laughs> being a dick but i just gave him a square face and made him look unpleasant okay yeah so you know like a lot of the time it's it's <laughs> How cartoony and fun are my characters? Well, it depends how much I would like them as real people. <laughs> but I mean, even then, um, from reading Octopus and then just seeing a couple of experts uh, of Haunted Hill, they're very expressive, just like you mentioned as well. Definitely. You see that. <laughs> and how has it been um, in the con circuit ever since, um, you know, everything's kind of starting back uh, back up or I guess it's been open uh, the world's been open, I guess, for about a year now. But how's the concert get going for you? It's been it's been really uh, wild, actually. Like I had, I kind of hadn't done cons uh, for a while before COVID. Like I'd done, I think I'd done some stuff for Blastosaurus when I was still with Golden Apple. Fuck them. Um, <laughs> but I had, I hadn't really like been out on my own, running like running my own booth or having my own table for a while, and so. I decided 2020 was the year I was going to get back to that. I had a bunch of stuff lined up. Obviously, all disappeared. 2021, I did Comic-Con Special Edition and uh, 
LA Comic Con and they were like, but I just just like as an attendee and, and doing panels. And there was like this energy around like, oh, everyone's back. Everyone's here and everyone's excited. And it was that that, that week from like uh, LA Comic Con was one week. No, no, San Diego was was like the weekend of Thanksgiving. Everyone was like there and excited and like, we hate our families. So we came to this. And then the week after that was LA Comic Con. And then like I think the Saturday night of that was when Omicron was announced. And so then mm-hmm. Sunday was just dead. And I was like, oh fuck, we all got tricked. Like we thought it was gonna be good again. We we were everyone was like, what if the 20s are just like the 20s and everyone gets into lots of sex <laughs> and drugs? And instead it was like, what if we all got scared one too many times and just broke? And it felt like that was the point where we broke. And so 2022, I think I did um I did Fan Expo Vancouver and it was really good but i had three days notice that i was doing it so i had like a shitty old banner i had like a real mix of stock of like kids stuff and adult stuff and like no cohesion and then i did nothing else for the rest of the year like i was i just never knew where i was going to be so this year i did fan expo again and it was um it was absolutely fantastic because i was actually prepared for it i had my big richard sucks banner behind me with the bottle of poppers on it all the gays knew what it was. And because poppers are illegal in Canada, like every gay in Canada was like, oh, you got poppers on your, uh, oh, you're selling little fake bottles of poppers. Oh, that's really interesting. Do you know where I can get real ones though? And like, <laughs> I'll buy your book. We can just talk for longer. And like, where can I get some of that, that good, good puff and fume? And um, so like that went really well. And I got into this like weird headspace where I was like, oh, maybe conventions are where it's at again. Maybe I can go back to like my old life was I would do six conventions a year. And that was like 80% of my income. Yeah. And, and it, like, but that was because I lived in New Zealand and there's nothing else to do. So everyone goes to the conventions. So when I came here, I was like, oh, I bet they're really big here. And instead it's like, you know, a, a decent sized convention is 10 to 15,000 people. Whereas in New Zealand, that is the smallest a convention can get. And so um, it's been like a, a weird learning curve where like Fan Expo was great. And then I did uh, the Festival of Books in LA and everyone had told me that it was like this amazing show. And I had a great time and I made some money, but like the idea of what, what selling looks like in LA is so different to what it looks like. And like learning that, uh, I think I think I made like three grand all weekend and like, realizing what can be done in a con versus what can be done on Kickstarter or what can be done if you go back to the direct market, which I don't want to do. Like that's, I mean, it's, it's, it's not even that it's dying, which it is. It's that like, I don't want to be the person who shows up when something's dying, like, like walking into a party when everyone's like run out of alcohol and you're like, Hey, I'm here for some fun too. Oh, I'm only seeing the worst of it. That's quite depressing. Um, so I, I yeah it's it's been like I'm enjoying it I'm enjoying being back at cons I'm excited for Baltimore in September I'm excited. I'm doing a thought bubble uh, in uh, November I've got I'm in San Diego obviously but I'm I'm not tabling at San Diego I'm just doing some panels and some signings because I got another book coming out by then I'm on I've got nine books coming out this year or Jesus <laughs> I've got I've got ten books coming out this year I just looked at my schedule I thought I had nine I actually and I had thought I had nine and then one of them got bumped to 2024. And so I was all like panicking because I'd announced nine books. I was like, I'm going to look like a massive failure to like the four people who saw that post. And then I remembered that I had two others. So it was actually okay. Ah, Man, 10 bucks. That's still insane. How do you manage to, you know, just keep on working and being so creative? How do you not burn yourself out? Uh, Ritalin? uh, Just lots of Ritalin. (laughs) Um, (laughs) That's just part of it. It's also, I'm actually, I'm in a weird state at the moment because I've, I've decided that I'm going to try and have like healthier sleep because I do mm-hmm. like my like my favorite thing to do is do three hours of sleep at night then an hour and a half nap in the middle of the day but I started finding that when I took a midday nap I would feel like gross afterwards um and it was just like I think something to do with the light or like I was waking up at the wrong moment or something but maybe if I can do the full four and a half hours at night I'll feel better but that means that I have to cut out coffee. I, I'm not drinking coffee after 9 p.m. anymore. And that's, I'm, I'm three days into that. And I'm definitely, like, I'm cheating. Like, I'm just making sure I drink the same amount of coffee, but I'm just like, like at 8.55, <laughs> I'm standing in my kitchen, just pouring it down my throat. <laughs> um, but I need to, I need to get healthier and better at that. Because I'm 38. Like, uh, I'm not, I'm, I'm not as young as I used to be. I can't, I can't do the, um, I can't do the stay out till 4 a.m. Be back on the show floor at 7 a.m. thing. I probably still can. We'll find out. I don't know. I'll see how (laughs) it goes. 
Who, yeah, I was gonna say, uh, you know, you have San Diego Comic Con. Who knows? Maybe they'll you'll be able to do it. <laughs> I hope so. And the thing is, like, I don't have to wait for anything at the moment. You know, I, I get mm -hmm. to I get to wake up in the morning, um, and walk straight to my my drawing desk and and just go. And I don't have to worry about anything else and anything getting in my way. And yes, it would be really nice to leave the house a little bit more than I do. And it would be really nice to like have some balance and like, you know, but I can talk to people on the phone while I'm drawing. I can listen to podcasts while I'm drawing. I can listen to music while I'm drawing. I can watch One Tree Hill again while I'm drawing. I only watch terrible TV shows while I'm drawing, so I don't get distracted by them. So I can just, anything that ran for like eight seasons or more, I will leave playing in the background and try and make my way through it. I've never made it to the end of Smallville, but I, I, I was sort of tap out at about season six. I'm like, I want to get to Bizarro at some point, but I know he's going to be very bad. So or... yes, that's how it <laughs> But also, like, to be fair, some of the books I'm putting out this year are not that long. Like, um, like Octopus is 144, Haunted Hills 128. Um, but like X Wives of Frankenstein, my the next Kickstarter, which is in mid August, is it's like it's a single issue. Like, I'm only doing 24 pages of that. It's going to be four single issues that I'll release. Um, I think Haunted Hill two might come out this year i haven't really decided and i'm doing things like i did i did a sequel to a follow-up to octopus called too hot for octopus which was all a handwritten journal like 45 page handwritten journal with illustrations of um like where are the men from the story now mm -hmm. um so you know that one obviously like it's not really handwritten like I, I mean it is but i i wrote it first and then i went through and transcribed it and edited it and, and it's, it's still i still change my mind halfway through lots of things so there's bits scribbled out and little doodles in the margins and everything but like you know that that was a book that i was able to make while i had to go to australia for a friend's wedding so i was able to make that while i was on an airplane and and on various buses and things you know it wasn't like i had to be set up at my drawing desk for that thing gotcha and um, as being an independent uh, comic book creator, uh, what would you say are some of the uh, best, um, I guess, benefits uh, of being an independent uh, comic book creator? Um, that I can do whatever I want. I mean, like, you know, okay, so so sure, there's people pressuring me to put tits on covers, but I don't <laughs> have to. I get to, and by the way, since doing that cover with all the dicks on it, I posted it onto, onto twitter.com and I've had like three other offers from people who want me to do variants for them. So I'm doing like, I'm finally getting, I'm getting paid money to draw Grandpa Monster's erection. Like, that's a dream. <laughs> that is the dream job for me. I have thought so much about that vampire's dick in my life. I am so excited to finally get to put it on paper. <laughs> Like I'll have to look it up. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like, okay, like collaboration is great. I love collaborating. I love the energy of like talking through ideas with people. But mm -hmm. working independently means also that if I feel like doing an entire book on my own, I don't have to wait for a company to say yes. I don't have to wait for anyone. And like, like Haunted Hill exists because I, was, I had two days off. And by the way, that company didn't get me notes on that two-page synopsis for eight months. By which time Whoa. I didn't give a single shit about that story anymore. Why would I still care about a thing I came up with like eight months earlier? And so I delivered to them a pretty mediocre book. Okay. Don't buy cardboard yet. It sucks butts. <laughs> Worst thing I've ever done. And um, I do want to kind of uh, go back to our very, very first conversation. Uh, you said that if we ever spoke to you again, uh, that you would talk about the uh, naked man that would uh, not leave your couch. <laughs> Holding you to it. <laughs> oh, God, he messaged me yesterday. Oh, um, no. <laughs> it doesn't end. Okay, look. So <laughs> this is going to sound like a brag, okay? But there, for some reason, how, how can I say this without sounding like an asshole? I can't. I'm going to sound like an asshole. Sometimes when I have casual sex with people, they think it means a lot more than it does. And sometimes people say things to me like, I can tell you really care about me by the way you fuck. And I'm like, I don't even know your fucking real name. Like, I know your username from Grinder, and you're like, you're just in my office right now. So five years ago, I had 
very mediocre sex with someone who didn't really match their profile picture. But like my mother has always said, if someone comes to your house and thinks you want to have sex with them, it's rude not to. So like I did the right thing. I had sex with him. There was a lot of hugging and a little bit of weeping. And he started telling me about his like bad marriage. I don't, I don't need like, no, that's not what I like. My username is hot dog enjoyer. Like I'm not here for this. <laughs> That's not true. My my username at that point was Rick Moranus because I was living in Canada but traveling. Um, so I uh, so I, I like okay, cool. You you know get out of here. He messages me the next day. I'm thinking like, I'll never see this dude again. He messages me the next day. That was so great. I really felt a connection. We should definitely do it again. Like, we haven't spoken. Messages me the day after that, and the day after that, and that, and I never respond. And then I, I eventually block him and then he comes back on same username but different account messaging me again and all he says is hello hello how are you are you there hello good morning how are you hello hello every single day this goes on for like three years okay and it, like it's, it's only when i'm in la like he always immediately sees when i'm like within distance because i don't know if you use grinder but it tells you location um or, or at least distance from you know nearby dicks mm -hmm. um <laughs> And so he can tell that I'm there. And then he messages me saying, Richard, I'd really like to see you again. I'm like, hey, you don't know my real name, buddy. Like, don't say Richard. That tells me that you have done research into who I am. Oh, no. <laughs> and then he, then I get a message that says, um, by the way, to my phone now, not to Grinder, but to my phone number. I get a text message that Whoa. says, hey, saw the light on in your office. Are you around? Oh, God. Now, I'm actually out of town at this point, but my friend is using my office. So I'm like, ignoring that one, block the number. Then I'm back in LA and uh, hello, hello, how are you? Hello, good morning, hello, hello, over and over. And I leave my office to go get some water, walk across the street to 7-Eleven. I'm walking back and I see him leaning on the gate. Now, my office is in, like, a pretty secure compound, like, since COVID. Like, he used to be very open to the world, and then they were like, no, nah, fuck it, we're going to have it locked up at all times. Um, and I'm like, I have to get through him to get back inside. And also, there's a bunch of people in the courtyard who I want, like, I would like to have a professional relationship with going forward. I mm -hmm. need to get this guy out of here. So um, I say to him, I'm like, hi, what are you doing here? He said, oh, I saw you. I was just driving past, and I saw you go across the street. I figured you'd be back soon. Like, all right and he said can i come in i was like you can but i'm working and i open the gate he follows me up the stairs and like they're very murdery looking stairs there's a huge steel <laughs> gate at the bottom of those two we get into the office i just point to the couch and say you can sit there i sit down at my desk and ignore him and work and i hear some like rustling and i glance this is after about like maybe 30 minutes i glance over and he's just buck ass naked, just sitting on my couch. I'm like, this is a new couch. It's not, it's like, it's an absorbent fabric. Like you're a sweaty, large man, please. I really, but I don't say anything. I just ignore it. I'm like, I'm not going to address the dick that's on display. I'm not going to address anything that's going on here. And like, he sat there for two hours sweating naked on my couch before standing up, putting his clothes on saying, I guess you're not really interested then. Leaves. And I'm like, cool, it's over. Next morning, hello. <laughs> How are you? Good morning. Hi. Richard, are you there? Every single day. And it's now it's now expanded to like like when I'm in Canada, he does this. Now I don't think he's gonna kill me. He doesn't have that kind of energy. But like we had me not? Like, not to brag, I'm not great at sex. I just have a lot <laughs> of it. Like I've put in my <laughs> 10,000 hours, but like Oof. Oh, man. Wow. Uh, yeah, that is one story, one scenario. Um, I can't believe he's still messaging you. No. Have, do, you do you think I think... should try again? Do you think I should, think I should just go for it? Uh, I mean, if it was mediocre at best, then absolutely <laughs> not. <laughs> How come you haven't tried changing like your phone number or anything? Or just blocking him? Oh. Because uh, like, I blocked the number, but you can't like if I block him on Grinder, he'll just like pop up with a new account as he's done a couple of times. Mm. But also, I won't give up my phone number because 
I dated this guy in my 20s who would always brag about how he had a 310 number and how they don't give those out anymore. And like very important and special that he has a 310 number because he's had a Hollywood number for so, or Beverly Hills number for so long. And this dude like was the love of my life or so I thought and like turned out to be kind of a monster, but no, no, not a monster, just like a dick. Um, But so when I moved to LA, First thing I did when I went to AT and T, I was like, "Hi, let me tell you a bunch of stuff about this ex of mine and how he thinks having a three one zero number is really important." And then let me give you some more details about how we broke up when I found out he was secretly married. Can I have a three one zero number? And they're like, "Absolutely, you can." So I get a three one zero number. They're not they they still don't give them out. Um, they now largely, if you see three one zero, it's usually a scam these days. But still, like I have the three one zero number, and I will not give that up. Like like. Like I live in Canada and pay for like an international plan to keep this number. Like I'm very right. no, that I didn't even know that was a thing about three one zero numbers. It's not like no one else cares. He, it's only him <laughs> who cares. But like, I, it's just a point of pride. Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't recommend doing it then. Then keep it. <laughs> <laughs> and also, uh, since you are a hot dog enthusiast. Uh, mm-hmm best uh best hot dog uh that you've had um since we last spoke and oh that's a tough one so i was hmm i told you about i I invented the dessert hot dog right i believe so yeah okay cool i will i won't repeat that i've been having some good ones of those lately i'm gonna explode at some point um (laughs) yeah i mean nothing has honestly like stood out that much. Like a lot of the time hot dogs are just like wonderful because of the, like the, how hungry you are when you find them. Um, I went to a a concert a couple of weeks ago and I bought a hot dog right outside of there and the hot dog was fine. Like it was, you know, nothing to write home about type of dog. But um, while I was there, some other people who had been to the concert were outside trying to figure out if the person on, uh, on scruff was the bassist from the band or not. And I really enjoyed listening to that conversation and eating a hot dog um, because they really wanted to fuck a bassist. And I think that's a rare thing to hear, you know? Yeah. Nobody likes the bassist. It's either exactly. the lead singer or the lead guitarist. Yeah. Those are the ones getting all the attention. <laughs> also, like, life hack. Never fuck a guitarist. I've heard. <laughs> <laughs> and so lastly here... Um... You know what? Um, even though that th- this is a re-release um, or volume one, but uh, what do you hope your readers get out of uh, Haunted Hill? Like, what sort of message? Um, I like with all of my books, I want to reinforce the idea that there is like a magical adventure just waiting somewhere below the surface, and that if you pay attention, cool shit will happen. Um, my idea of cool shit is a lot grimier than other people's, and maybe people <laughs> would like. You know, it's it's that thing of like when I tell a story about my life, I'm, I'll be telling a story about like a great fun thing I did one time, and people will look at me like, you, "Sorry, what?" That you think that's fun? <laughs> um, but you know, it's it, it it's interesting. It, that's that's what it comes down to is that like if you pay attention to the world, it is an interesting place, and I want people to uh, enjoy the sloppiness of it. I want people to find reassurance in a character who is like unbearable but always or almost always right um i think there's uh not to get on my high horse but uh, i put up okay look i put out a book called shed um where i co-wrote with my friend lucy campagnolo um a couple years ago the book came out this year and uh it got very good reviews a lot of people refer to it as the best comic of the year but it came out january 1st so you know low bar um but here's the thing about shed there are no men in the entire book and like not even background characters. Like there are background men in, in images, but none of them have a speaking role at all. And I remember talking to Lucy about it and how I like, no one wanted to interview her about the book. Everyone wanted to interview me, which is shitty. Um, but that no one ever asked me about that. And like, I remember Lucy was saying to me, like, she's like, if I had done a single interview, every single question would have been like, why do you not want to include men in your story? And I'm noticing the same thing with Haunted Hill that uh, everything that Eva says and everything, well, not every single thing, but pretty much everything Eva says and everything Eva does is something that I have said or done and been celebrated for. 
or if I made people uncomfortable, they have admitted that I was like right for calling someone out as a bullshit and they've still found it fun. But when I have a woman do it in a story, the constant refrain is, I'm really enjoying this book, but I fucking hate her. I would never want to meet her. I never want to hang out with her. She is awful. She's right, but she's fucking awful. Like, no, well, you're friends with me, though. You probably like me, and I'm doing the same shit. So maybe, you know, stop telling on yourself. Um, so I hope people realize that, uh, <laughs> I guess what I'm saying is, I hope people realize <laughs> I'm unbearable too. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I, I enjoy our talks. I enjoy uh, talking about your creative process. You don't seem like a terrible person. You may have done bad things in the past, but it seems like, you know, you moved on from I mean, that. I, like, I robbed <laughs> one bank, you know? Yeah. <laughs> That's not true. I've robbed two banks. That's I, I should oh. I should be clear. I, I, but one of them, like, statute of limitations is up, so I can say I robbed one bank. <laughs> uh, uh, We'll just cl uh, clip that out so you don't incriminate yourself. <laughs> No, it's fine. I'm not going to say which bank. Oh, okay. <laughs> I wasn't going to go into it either, so don't worry. Um, and finally, um, if you could give your younger self any piece of advice, uh, what would that piece of advice be? Um, the nervousness you will feel about having robbed that bank, you don't need to worry about because you will never, ever get caught. And one day you'll get to talk about it publicly a lot. Uh, but two, <laughs> there is absolutely no record of it. You're only taking $120 a day. You can massively up that. Three, don't use the money. You, don't use the quarter of a million dollars you stole to fund a feature film. It will never get finished. Yeah, well, <laughs> what's about the, uh, what happened with the feature film? Oh, it's it's one of those like, you know, when you're 22 and you think I can sell fund a feature film and it could be about comic books and I'm sure that everyone who sees it will have like read hundreds of Silver Age comics and understand the full history of the comic industry. And I won't need to go into detail about that at all. And I can just make it about characters quietly sitting and drinking tea together in Britain. Um, it's just, it's never going to go anywhere or do anything. And then, of course, like it was in the middle of editing that the Blastosaurus first got optioned. And then suddenly, like everything kind of turned to chaos for me. Um, also, when I started dating that guy who, who really cared about the 310 number. Um, and, you know, frankly, I, I, I chose um, living in Australia and having a lot of sex with him rather than staying in New Zealand and finishing the film. And then I, my house got robbed and all the tapes got taken and I hadn't like some of them weren't imported correctly. So I would have needed to do reshoots. And by that Ugh. point, the main character had shaved his head. And I was like, Ugh. I have wow. comics to make. I, I always think that I want to work in other industries. And then like every time I'm like, ah, oh, shit, I got comics to make. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, have you ever um do you ever hope that your comics um get turned into screenplays i don't well okay so here's where i'm at right now um a book that i've been working on for 15 years jesus 15 years uh that has like come and gone from my life multiple times I've, I've been completely fucked over by multiple companies on this book um a lot of people have owed me a lot of money and then vanished. And like, I, it's always been that I take full control of the thing back and, and make it work somehow. And also the main character is designed to look like my ex, the love of my life, who cares a lot about 310 numbers. Um, so it hurts to draw him every day. Uh, recently, someone came back and was like, hey, it's been like three years since you worked on Blastosaurus. Are you interested in like developing it for animation? like i'm not uh, i don't know and then yesterday i had my first development meeting for it with the 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 person um and talking about the story again i got all excited and like as long as it doesn't take away from haunted hill or any of my other like more current projects i'm excited mm -hmm. about it and then in the like the week leading up to this this meeting i've been like going back and forth like i reread all of blastosaurus there's 60 issues of this thing in different incarnations I reread it all. I got really familiar with the characters and I was like feeling good about it. And I started thinking like, it sucks that like I have these other properties that like that haven't really, like, I, I don't want to do this stuff, but I would love someone else to develop them. It is a shame now that I'm moving into more adult stuff that it's less likely. Like no one's going to do it, an animated series of Ex-Wives of Frankenstein. No one's going to do a, a, a movie of Octopus unless I become much more famous than I am. Um, there might be a Haunted Hill animation thing happening, but I, that's That'd be cool. far off in the distance. I, I don't know. Like it's a it's a crazy thing that might kill me, but we'll see. Um, <laughs> but you know, like I had that book, Black Sand Beach, 
Now I know that got option for TV and I know that a pilot was in development and I know that it got some funding to make this pilot. And I'm very much like out of the loop on the project because it's like with the publisher, they own everything and like, I'll get money if it happens. But I really thought it was going to die because someone leaked the script to me and it sucked buttholes. Like it was so <laughs> terrible. Um, and not, I'm, I'm not really precious about my stuff. It wasn't even because of that. It was like, they just, it was like, this doesn't need to exist. This is bad television. And then someone called me and was like, no, no, they've rewritten the script. It's much better now. But I was like, it's still never going to happen because that thing is out there. Anyway, Friday morning, I get a Google alert, like right, right when I'm in the middle of rereading Blastosaurus, I get a Google alert that says like, oh, Richard, there's an article about you. So I click on that. And it's like uh, New Zealand on air have funded eight and a half, like put eight and a half million dollars of funding into six projects to be produced in New Zealand in conjunction with other countries for worldwide distribution. Well, Black Sand Beach is one of them. Apparently, without me knowing, without anyone telling me, there is a fully funded TV series of Black Sand Beach going into production soon. They have a, well, an animation studio on board. They have everything. I, so I, I guess I'm definitely not involved. Apparently, I'm meant to have meaningful involvement as a consultant or producer, but I guess that ship has fucking sailed. But so I don't, I don't know. I don't know how to feel about it. It feels like a good thing, right? Like I have a TV right. show, I guess. But like... Who knows? I'm no one's talking to me. Ah, oh, that sucks. <laughs> but, but that also might be because I keep drawing dicks on covers, and maybe they don't want to like wheel me out to promote a children's show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah, that could be that could be true. <laughs> but I mean, people need to grow up. You're, yeah, exactly. you're transitioning from you know children's stuff to adult stuff. Yeah, people need to grow up. <laughs> yeah. And it's fine. If it if it happens, it happens. Uh, if it, if they do it well, I'll be thrilled. If they do it terribly, I probably won't care that much because, like, you know, there have been some bad incarnations in Ninja Turtles too, and that that franchise yeah. seems to still rule. Absolutely, but there have been no bad incarnations in Ninja Turtles. I'm lying. like, I mean, I guess Next Mutation no. was sort of <sighs> shitty, um, but like, I guess it kind of like it, like even original when it like once Shredder was dead and they brought in. Dread or Dredge or Dreg or whatever the fuck he was, the alien guy. That sort mm -hmm. of sucked. Well, uh, there's one that was a Nickelodeon show that I wasn't a big fan of uh, for Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Which one? The, the, the 3D one or the 2D I one? Think, I think the 3D one. Really? Yeah. I thought that one was like the best one. It had an amazing voice cast, but I just couldn't get into it. It was mainly due to the animation. That's what threw me off. I gotta say, like, that came out the same time as that 3D animated Batman that like the mm -hmm. one that had been like delayed because of the guns um and ninja turtles look so much better just the textures and the layering and the, like, the just the different values of characters to backgrounds it felt like it just felt amazing compared to like this shitty glossy playstation 2 level batman thing that was happening I um that batman show too <laughs> but like i i don't know i there were parts of it that I didn't like. I, I think they didn't lean into the, they leaned into the grossness too much for story rather than comedy. Um, and so by the time it gets to season three, I think it's falling apart a little bit, but I, I, I think it, it, I think it holds up. And I, again, it's another, like, I just have a big crush on splinter. So I'll really watch anything with him. <laughs> and, uh, well, um, the new movie looks really good. Did I cut out? An old man who's willing to live in the sewers. <laughs> okay. Like, I liked the Michael Bay movies. Like, um, like, when everyone else was, like, hating on the Michael Bay films, I came out of that first one, I was like, that film needed to be 20 minutes longer, and it would have solved all of the problems. Yeah, I can. I only saw the first one. I never saw the sequel. Uh, the sequel. I don't know why. Because no one liked the first one. Of course you okay. didn't see the second one. No one cared about the first one, so no one saw the second one. The, the first one was, like... It's that we never cared about April. We never cared about Splinter. So we like it was the script relied on us to have been fans of Turtles for thirty years and just be like on board for anything happening to those characters by name rather than by actual personality or action. And if that had the extra time to show Megan Fox doing her thing, having her weird roommate, all of that, it could have been really fun and cool. And if we cared about Splinter by the time he gets taken out, it would have been amazing. But we didn't. He was just a name and a look. Yeah. And the second one, I mean, it was nice to have Bebop and Rocksteady and things, but, you know, and it was nice to see a Technodrome being built, but it, it didn't, I don't know, didn't do a lot. <laughs> yeah, I agree. And then uh, 
they did some recasting for some of the turtles too, which kind of threw me off as well, uh, voicing wise. Oh, I forgot that. Yeah, I guess people got busy. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, um, anything else um you'd like to add before we wrap this up? Uh, I guess, yeah, I guess I should probably tell people that they should go to kickrichard.com. Um, that'll take them straight to the campaign. And uh, to to back that, like, look, this book is me distilled into paper, essentially. So if you enjoy this interview, oh. it's it's a sloppy version of this on a page, and you can get some original art, you can get a donut sticker, and you can get some Polaroids from around Hollywood. And um, if you want my more refined things, then just wait a month, and you can get Four Color Heroes, my next graphic novel, um, which is about two teenage boys who fall in love through comic books um despite being from very different backgrounds so that one's the nice digitally colored one that looks all pretty and shit and has superheroes in it is that one gonna make us cry yeah probably will actually Ugh. <laughs> okay. like it'll make you laugh a lot but it, it should give you at least one cry Ugh. i'm just trying right. to get back in florida <laughs> i'll still read it but i will tweet at you if i if it makes me cry <laughs> oh, by the way, when 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 will this interview actually come out? Oh, uh, good question. Um, well, we have an amazing editor, so I can uh, tell him that this needs to be a priority and have it out um, this week. Okay. Um, I don't know what it's going to be yet. So I've been doing things for early backers. So everyone who backed in the first 48 hours got chapter one of x Vibes of Frankenstein. Everyone who backs by June 9th at 9 a.m. gets... Um, the first chapter of Four Color Heroes, and everyone who backs by, I think, June 16th, I'm going to be doing uh, another free thing. I don't know what it's going to be yet, but, like, I have so many comics that people haven't seen, so I'll be I'll be putting something together for that. It, my, oh, I just wrote a I wrote a horror story about a, a woman who, who orders a pizza using the Domino's pizza tracker and then tracks it until she shits it out, so I might I might put that one out as the as the as the incentive. <laughs> I'll read it. I understand what the word is. <laughs> and then, um, yeah. So uh, your social media handles, uh, where can we find you? Um, so I'm Richard Fairgray everywhere at Richard Fairgray on Twitter and Facebook. Um, I don't really fuck around on Instagram anymore. I used to, but it all felt a shit. But because I lost the password to the Richard Fairgray account, I'm now Richard Fairgray author on there. And I do every now and again, I remember to post something, but yeah. Um, yeah, my, my phone number begins with a 310, and if it's meant to be, you'll guess the other seven. Um, <laughs> and, you know, my my office is a very visible window from the street in the world's first shopping mall. So if you need to track me down, see if my light is on, and come and sit naked on my couch, uh, go ham, I guess. Wow. You heard it. We have an open invite. <laughs> <laughs> that's going to backfire on me, isn't it? Like, <laughs> like, I jokingly say people should send me hot dogs in the mail, and then I get, like, six-week-old fucking hot dogs when I get back to my office, and I get butt sick for days. Yeah, I still can't believe that's a true story. Uh. Uh. Okay, and um, all right, so that takes care of that. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, so my social medias are super commie, uh, Danny, uh, across all social media handles. You can go ahead and listen to podcasts like this one or interviews like this one at www.geek-network.com. And all our social medias are at geeks az uh that's where you can find us and uh richard as always it was a pleasure thank you so much for your time i hope you enjoy the rest of your day i i will thank you mm -hmm.